the word came power in the blood of the Lamb. I said this power, power, wonder work and power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Let's sing it like we believe it. There is power, power, there's wonder work. Precious blood of the Lamb. One more time. I said, There's power, power, there's wonder work and power in the blood of the Lamb. I said, There's power, power, there's wonder work and power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Come on, let's give the Lord another hand clap. If you're glad to be in Sunday school today. Amen, amen. There's nothing like Sunday school. And That's right. if we ever get the uh, understanding of how powerful Sunday school is, I think we would probably study our lessons more. And I'm talking about me as well. Everybody say amen. amen. For all of us, praise the Lord, because it is the Word of God. And I'm excited to be able to teach the Word of God today. Brother Terry, would you ask the Lord to bless this Sunday school offer? Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Use it, Lord. Lord, you've accepted us, Lord, as your church, Lord Jesus, Lord, as you direct us today, Lord. Teach us, Lord Jesus, Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear today, Lord. Lord, we pray that you just minister in each one of these classes, Yes, Jesus. Lord, to these teachers, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege, Lord, of being able to give back to you a portion that you've already blessed us with, Lord. It's already yours. Lord, I pray you bless us. Multiply in Jesus' name. Amen. And the church said amen. amen. God bless you today. You can be seated. Oh, you already seated. My bad. Praise God. Amen. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, Sunday school. Sunday school. Amen. How many remembers when you was growing up, they used to sing that song, the wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. Some of you don't remember that, but uh, some of us had to ride the church bus, and I'm thankful for the church bus picking me up. And they are off today picking up kids. I hope they was able to pick up uh, a few. Last night revival was awesome. I'm telling you, we had a great revival last night. I've been to conferences. I've been across the world. But when the Lord moves, it's just always good. And I love what I saw kids crying for the Holy Ghost last night. And we're going to see it again here in a few moments. Amen. I love revival. It doesn't matter if it's kids or youth or everybody's revival. Praise God. And I believe it was great last night. We had them... I believe from like 77 to about one year old here last night. It was awesome, amen, to have a great time in the Lord, in revival, praise the Lord. But today I want to preach a, uh, or teach, not really preach. Um, it just got landed on me to teach this lesson today, and I, I began to think about this lesson, and I really, I really wanted to teach something else because this is revival. And I thought, you know, God, I went to prayer with God and with my own attitude at first, and I said, God, I said, this is revival. I need something that will make these adults shout, something that will make them excited about church. And, and if you are a preacher, you understand what I'm saying. You want people to really get motivated while you're teaching or preaching. You don't, you don't like people to just sit there and stare at you when you're teaching. You know, if you're a preacher, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. If you're a preacher, you, you like to hear somebody say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Amen. Amen! Preach! Amen. Say it again, preacher. Amen. We was growing up, we had a guy tell us, he'll say, Shell the corn, preacher. Shell the corn. And one day he jumped up and said, go ahead and throw the cob too. Hallelujah. So we like, we like response when you're teaching and preaching. And, and I said, God, I said, I need something besides this lesson today. I, God, I, will, I tell you what, God, just tell me what you would do. And that's what I want to do. And it's almost like I heard in my spirit God say, I would wash their feet. And I thought, Wow. Okay, God, this, this is a children revival, and I'm trying to give these adults something to chew on today that uh, besides the good things they're going to hear in a little bit, but I want to give them something else. So it's almost like I heard him say, wash their feet. I said, oh, Lord. And so I've got my bucket ready today, and I just need a volunteer here in a little bit. Not really. I'm not going to literally wash your feet today, but I would. 
There's not a person in here today I would not wash your feet. I don't care how you smell. I don't care if you washed them last night. I don't care. I would wash your feet today. I'm, I'm not just saying that. I really would. But so I began to study and I began to read and I knew there was something deeper than just me literally washing your feet. I thought about it and I thought, you know, there's something deeper to this meaning of washing people's feet today. And I began to think about it. I said, well, I want to study a little harder. I want to go a little deeper. And so uh, all the teachers, they came and got all the books off of my desk. So I, don't ha I didn't have a Sunday school book, but I had the, the words right here. So uh, I thought I had a couple extra books, but undoubtedly some of y'all got a couple extra books. And I didn't have a book, so I began to study and I began to look and, and I learned some things this week in studying God's Word. How many knows you can learn something by studying God's Word? He says, study to show thyself approved. And I want to read our, our text before I get too sidetracked today, but our focus thought today is on your paper. It says, Jesus' example of foot washing calls the church to humility and, and community and service. And John 13, 14 is our focus verse. Is one you're probably going to hear me say two or three times today. It says, If I then, your Lord and Master, uh, lay aside the garments and took a towel and girded... I'm sorry. Back up. I got, I got ahead of myself. If I then, your Lord, your Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And they're working on the computer. So if you're going to turn your Bibles there, you can go ahead. Uh, I think they got some computer problems going on. But then verse... Uh, Chapter 13, verse 4 says this, and we'll go through 15. He rises from supper and, and lay aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After he poureth water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. Now I want you to catch that. It was, it was um, right here in this verse that he, he poureth the water into a basin, but it was also he rises from supper. Y'all keep that in your mind. In other words, they done been in this room for a little while. They done had dinner. They done celebrated, talking and communication going on. But he did this. And in verse 6 says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, doest thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt be hereafter. No, hereafter. And Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, my feet... Not my feet only, but also my hands, my head. And he says, and Jesus said unto him, He that washeth needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. And he's talking to the disciples here. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are all clean. So after that he washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down aside. He said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master Lord, and you say, well, for I, so I am. And he says, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. And so I, I began to look at this lesson this week and praying, and I said, God, what are you trying to tell me? And I don't think uh, in my life, at my particular time where I'm at today, uh, I couldn't have taught a better lesson than where I'm at today. Uh, I'm glad it landed in my lap to teach it today because I feel it was for me, number one. And this lesson was brought to my heart and my understanding of what foot washing really is all about. Now, I, I know today, uh, as I begin to read and, and I thought about, I want to get a hold of what you mean, Lord. First of all, I don't think uh, literal foot washing is a hell or, or a heaven issue. I don't think you're going to go to hell if you don't wash my feet, okay? Literally, if I say today I want somebody to come wash my feet and you refuse to, I won't say you're going to hell. I wouldn't say that. I believe the, the, the thing is this, though. If it's a pride issue, then you might go to hell. All right? Now, sometimes we cover it up like it's not a pride issue. I'm not prideful, but sometimes that's the biggest word because man, pride goes before a fall, and we have to be careful. But if it is a pride issue, it could be a heaven or hell issue. But unless... It's, you know, if we don't understand the reason what it's all about. Some believe foot washing was just for the uh, chosen time. It was a custom of the time. If you read through the scripture uh, most of the time or all the time, pretty much, if you went to visit somebody's home, they met you at the door, washing your feet at the door. 
And usually it's a servant or it's a, uh, or, or somebody low that's, that's not in head or leadership. And it's somebody there and, and they begin to wash their feet. And probably because it was more sandals in those days and no telling what was on their feet and they were dirty. And, uh, but what they done was they washed the dirt off of their feet as they came into the home. It was the first thing. In other words, you're welcome to my home. You're, I, I humble myself. I'm so honored to have you in my house. And I had an aunt one time that, uh, and I don't know if she still does this. She probably does. But if you go see her, you took your feet, your shoes off at her door. And she didn't want anybody's shoes on her carpet. And she was very uh, adamant about it. Whoever it was, please take your shoes off. And it was just those things. But nevertheless, it was dirt on these feet that they had to be washed. And in our text, Jesus just got up from supper. Now, remember I said, remember that part. And he began to wash the disciples' feet. So I thought to myself, if it was a custom, their feet should have already been washed. If it was a custom to clean their feet... Before the dinner, they should have had, before they even got into the meeting, they should have already had clean feet. But Jesus, I believe, had a different reasoning for the foot washing. He had a different thought of why we should be washing one another's feet. Now, some say Jesus washed his disciples' feet. With, uh, it was an act of humility. In other words, he was humbling himself, showing us this is how we ought to be humble. But to me, one of the greatest humility in Jesus Christ's life was when he left the throne... And came and robed himself in flesh in a world that's full of sin and iniquity. And to take up all the sin of the world. That's humility to me. To leave from your throne and come down here. That's the greatest thing of humility. Not only did he do that, but he also came uh, riding on a donkey. He didn't pick, he didn't pick the best horse, the stallion to ride across the, the way with or the greatest chariot. And, you know, he's the king of kings. And if you're the king, you ought to be the greatest. And he didn't do that. But he, he came in... On a donkey, and and you know we all know he was born where in a stable. He didn't pick the finest hospital. You know we all have a problem with that. We want the best hospital, want the best things going on, the cleanest hospital. But he was in a stable where all the feces were from all the animals and all the things that was there. And this is how this is how humble he came. And and top all of that off, he was a carpenter. Now, how many of you ever just in your life, there may be one or two in here, but just in your life you thought, you know what, I want to just take, I want to be a carpenter. That's, that's what I want to be. No, we always, when we're growing up, we want to think of something that's going to make the greatest money. The, we want to be in leadership, but you know, the, the great things in life. But Jesus came humble. In our, and I believe, I'm going to say this, I'm going to plug this in because I don't want you to forget this. But in our Christian walk today, and this is really, I want you all to really understand what I'm about to tell you. There's not a soul in here today that you have not treaded through some dirty things this week. You have walked through some dirt this week. I'm not talking about physical dirt. I'm talking about things that we're not proud to say today. We wouldn't stand and tell nobody, hey, I, I did this this week. And I don't think there's nobody here who would stand and admit everything you've done this week because there's something inside of you that we want to hold it back. But you know what we've done? We have walked uh, through the filth of the world. Everybody here has walked through the filth of the world. You go to Walmart, there's all kinds of filth. <laughs> Amen. You go to restaurants, there's all kinds of filth. I can prove it to you. I mean, because a lot of times we pet our foot to the filth that's coming across the speaker. And we don't even catch it until we finally thought, well, I remember that in the 1970s. Woo, that's good. But if it was a sin in 1970, it's still a sin in 2017. Praise God. But we, we, we're, we're trapped in a world that's full of filth. We're trapped in a world that we walk every day into a situation. And then we justify that it's just the way it's going to have to be. But Jesus said, i got to be in the world, but I don't have to be of the world. We don't have to partake of the things of the life and the sin that's pushing us so hard. We don't have to do it, but our, our bodies are overloaded with things that we have to get into. We have to stand beside them on the assembly line that's telling dirty jokes. Or, or we have to stand beside those that are cursing and and, uh, you know, I even had a community service guy yesterday two times. He slipped up and said a bad word. And I gave him that Holy Ghost look, you know. And, and he said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And before he left, he apologized again. But there's, it's just sometimes things, even though we don't even try, we end up getting into dirty things in our life. And so in our text today, just three weeks prior to this text, history says it's about three weeks. And... You can find it where it's recorded in Luke chapter 22 and Mark 10 if you want to write these down. About three weeks before our text, the disciples were in a heated discussion. 
They was in a very heated discussion. And this is where they was discussing who was going to take the, the ruler, the, the, the government of Jesus that when he is gone. Who's going to be the head chief? Who's going to be this? And, and does that sound familiar? We all want to take the head chief's position. And if it looks like you're going to get my position, then you and I are going to have a problem. We're going to have. So they begin to have this discussion. It was a heated discussion. So in our text today, in verse 1, this event, I don't know if y'all ever thought about it, but this event took place in the same room that the day of Pentecost happened on. They was in the upper room, the same situation. You'll study that. You'll find out they were in the upper room having a foot washing. So a lot of times, if we would learn to be, have the humility and don't mind foot washing, you might have a Pentecost in your life. Sometimes you've got to start here before you get up here. Well, I have never really started up here. You always start down here. So in this event, it was in the upper room. The Pentecost came a few days later, we know. But in verse 2 here, we, we see the momentum for the royal priesthood that began to take, or the royal service that was about to take place here. And Jesus was compelled to wash the disciples' feet. He was compelled. How many here today have you ever been just compelled to go wash somebody's feet? How many's ever washed somebody's feet without being in a regular foot washing service? Probably nobody. I haven't. I, I, I've said in myself, I said, uh, brother, if I have offended you, I will wash your feet. But they never took me up on that. And part of my flesh says I'm glad they didn't. But that's flesh, right? Everybody with me today? You know, we don't understand the power that is in foot washing, though, today. So, but Jesus was compelled. No matter the uh, humiliation we feel like he had to go through, the reason he was compelled, and this is it right here. Y'all stay with me for a few moments. He knew his enemy. Jesus knew his enemy. Church, you better know your enemy today. Your enemy is out to destroy you, and he wants to destroy you, and he's going to make you think that you're all right the way you are. And the whole time, he's destroying your life. He's destroying your character. He's destroying the things that are good about you because you feel, I got a right to be where I am. I got a right to feel the way that I feel. But Jesus knew his enemy, and he knew the enemy was about to strike and betray him. He knew, and he had to act before the enemy struck. And I think it's time for the church body, body of Christ, not just Pastor Hunt, but the body of Christ to catch on this before the enemy strikes us. Let's get the, the, the spirit that Jesus had when he called the disciples together and he began to wash their feet and he began to tell them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. This you may not understand right now. I'm sorry. This you may not understand right now, but you will in the sweet by and by. And today some of you may not understand what I'm teaching today, but there's going to come a day that you're going to say, I remember Brother Hunt preaching about foot washing. So church, we have two enemies in our life, two kinds of enemies. And this is going to blow your guy's mind. The first one is very simple. You know this is an enemy and the enemies that, are, uh, uh, that hell has against us. That's an enemy that's coming straight out of hell. That enemy that comes and don't want us to worship, don't want us to focus on Jesus, don't want us to be faithful to God, don't want us to be a consistent and, and don't want us. That's the enemy that comes and tries to destroy us. But the second enemy is going to blow your mind. Let me tell you who the second enemy is. Are you ready? The second enemy is the church. You say, what do you mean, Brother Hunt? The enemy is out of the church. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be honest with you. The hardest I've ever been in my life was people that was in the church. Now I got some people understanding what I'm saying. There's enemies that are in the church that's going to try to destroy you because they don't like your position. And they don't like you to stand and preach this or that. And, and hey, I've been talked about. I preached messages that were straight out of the Word of God. And people would leave and say, well, blah, 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 blah. The enemy is out to attack God's Word. You get in the anointing of God, people don't understand the anointing. And so they, they take it as the preacher being upset and mad at them. If you live in the world long enough, you get so much dirt in your life that, that nothing moves you anymore. You can come to church and sleep on a Pentecostal pew. Nothing bothers you. I'm talking about spiritually sleep. You're just sleep. Everybody else is having revival, but you're back there like, ah. Because so much dirt's piled on us. But the enemy in our churches today is, is coming after us to destroy us. There's people today, matter of fact, that have backslid over somebody hurting them in a church because they wasn't prepared for the enemy when they came. I'm teaching to you today, church. You just listen to me. 
If you're not prepared for the enemy, you will backslide when he comes against you. And it might be your brother. It might be your sister that you thought was your brother and you thought was your sister. But let me just by a show of hands. Anybody ever been hurt by somebody in a church? It hurt you so bad, and, but you're still here. That's the good thing. You're still here. So undoubtedly, you got a hold of that thing called uh, uh, the, the, the foot washing, the spirit that was behind it. So here we are. He says, Let, let's come together. i got to do this. So the disciples had to, I believe, had to be strengthened and fortified once the enemy, because the enemy was fixing to strike. And they had to be touched in their life, strengthened, because what was going to happen was if they wasn't strengthened, they was going to be, it was going to be too late. That's why it's important to stay faithful to God in your worship. Because if you're not worshiping God, the devil's going to talk to your mind and he's going to tell you all the, the enemy's going to come in and try to destroy you. But church, we got to be faithful to God and, and put our minds to it and say, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be caught off guard when the enemy comes in. And I personally believe that Jesus in this text was building a church. Because he said this, for he told Peter, if thou, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you can't be a part of me. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a pastor today, and I'm a part of the bride of Christ. I am a part of Jesus Christ. I'm part of him. But if I don't let him wash me, oh, being washed, my friend, you have to be washed to become a part of the church. You say, my feet, Brother Hunt? Not only your feet, but your hands, your eyes, your heart. As Peter said, my whole body, Lord. Touch me all over, God. Just wash me. I want to be a part of you. And that's why we submerge in Jesus' name. We don't sprinkle you because only a little bit's going to get on you. But we want to wash you to and through. And when you become baptized in Jesus' name, I can prove it by the scripture, my friend. You are a part of the body of Christ. Jesus said, if you don't let me wash you, you can't be a part of me. See, we don't catch this sometimes. We only see the feet and the the, the toenail fungus in between our feet or whatever we got, you know. And Oh, that's nasty, Brother Hunt. That's, that's curled up toenails. That's, that's this, that's that. I, there's no telling what Jesus saw on the disciples' feet. But he didn't see just feet. He saw failures. He saw cheating. He saw betrayal. He saw lying. He saw uh, 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 just all kinds of things in these guys' bodies. And he said, hey, I need to cleanse you. It wasn't just the feet. And I, I'm jumping way ahead of myself today. But verse 3 and 5, here's the extreme demonstration of the royal service. He, now, let me ask you a question. How many of you really would love to just stoop low today and wash somebody's feet in your life? No, it's hard to understand why we would do that. But would you stoop that low? Jesus knew who he was about to wash their feet. He knew who they was. He knew who he was. If you'll read that verse 3 and 5, you'll find out he knew who he was. He knew what he was sent for. And he knew that uh, there was going to be two guys that he was about to wash these two guys' feet. And he knew that one was going to betray him and one was going to deny he even knew who he was. So could you imagine me washing a man's feet knowing that he's got all against me and knowing that he's going to try to kill me, he's going to try to have me killed? Come on, or he did have Jesus killed. But Jesus says, no, I'm going in and I'm going to wash his feet anyway. So I'm getting way ahead of myself again. But you know what, my friend? We know that Jesus had a humility and, and those two that was coming against. But Jesus told us for us to do as he has done. And we take that literally as, because we still practice it here. When we have our New Year's Eve service, we will do a foot washing. Some of you participate, some of you don't. I, 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 I mean, I'm not going to say you're going to go to hell for it, but I will say you're missing the greatest blessing you've ever had in your life by not washing another man or another woman's feet. You're missing a greatest blessing. I'm telling you, it's greater than any financial blessing you ever had in your life because it's almost like your heart opens up. And it's, it's just a great I mean, a feeling when you wash people's feet. But Jesus took off, let's talk about this a minute. Jesus took off the outer garment and he began to wash the feet of the men despite, like I said, who he was, uh, or who he's supposed to be. You know, the, uh, and the reason he, he came in so humble that Y'all remember the uh, Pharisees, they begin to, he can't be the king. Look how he's coming in. Look how he's dressing. And this is the world that we live in today. 
People go to churches that the preacher is a certain style of a preacher. I'm talking about his looks and his, his character, not character, but his, his uh, uh, I guess you can call the, the things of the world that he has and the prestige that he has and how he's able to pronounce words. And, and they feel like, friend, if, you, if that's what you're in it for, you're in for the wrong thing. And that's what the Pharisees thought, that they were going to grab a hold of something and this can't be him because he's not this and that. But, so Jesus knew who he was. But he gave the most extreme demonstration, I believe, that, uh, of a service that was possible by washing the feet that was supposed to be, as I said earlier, to the lowest jobs or the lowest uh, slave that they had on that time, whatever they had going that moment. But verse 6 and 11, what happened now was, was a critical for every person who claimed to be a follower and a servant of the Lord. So this is what we had. The, 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 the crucial point is the statement that Peter made in verse 8. If we can read that again, Peter said, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered and said, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part in me. And there was a deeper meaning, as I said a moment ago. And, I, and I'm, I'm repeating myself a minute because I want you to really understand this. Now, don't, don't leave today and say, Brother Hunt says, If I don't let him wash my feet, I'm not a part of his church. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you don't let Jesus wash you through and cleanse you through, you cannot be a part of the body of Christ. You can be a person that sits on a pew and enjoy the music and enjoy the preaching and pat your pastor on the back every now and then, a great job. But to be a part of the body of Christ, that's who Jesus is coming back and get, by the way. He's not coming back to get just anybody that, joined, that, that came to church, but he's coming back to get those who are a part of the body of Christ. So... So here we are, a person, you know, we got to be washed. So before you ever can serve Christ, you must be a part of Christ. Before you can become a part of the, of the bride of Christ, you must be washed and cleansed by Christ. He's the one that cleanses you. When you come out of the water, you're different. Washing and cleansing, I believe, are misunderstood. And Peter saw the washing of everyone's feet. And that's why he felt that, you know, that's too humiliating to let my, my Lord wash my feet. And he thought to himself, he says, uh, there's no human that, that, that can wash my feet because that's, that's just stepping too low. But Peter only saw the human and the physical side of this. And a lot of us today, the only reason we don't let people wash our feet is because we only see the human and the physical side of it. But the, I'm here to tell the church something. There's more spiritual thing to it than you ever thought you ever could imagine. It's not just the physical and the, it is a lot to do with it. It is humbling yourself. But we got to look beyond that because it's more to it than just being a, the, uh, the uh, physical or, you know, part of it. But it's actually as we serve others. And people today, they still misunderstand all this that I'm trying to tell you. So they, they misunderstand the mission, the service that Jesus came and cleansed men of their sin and, and, and death. That he came to cleanse men with his blood that we just got through singing about. He claimed to cleanse us. And he understood that the disciples was in a position in their life that they're not going to be able to handle about what's about to happen. Because i got to get everything out. This last supper together, he understood. They're not going to be able to understand. It. And church, I want to tell you, the enemy is out to destroy you. And I'm going to tell you, I just feel this in the Holy Ghost this morning. Tell somebody, we're at the end of this thing. This could be our last supper that we get today. This could be our last service that we have today. And I wonder how much you would get involved if you knew this was your last service today. We never know. The disciples really, they, they knew what Jesus was saying and they heard what he was saying just like we do today. We hear the preacher preaching and we know what he's saying and it does sound good, but I just don't comprehend what you're talking about. And, and I don't think they really had it in their heart to the point of realizing this is the last time we're ever going to be able to eat with Jesus besides when he came back from death. We know he came where they was at. But what I'm talking about today is we don't know what tomorrow brings. But we got to hold on. And I believe washing and cleansing has a deeper meaning and spiritual meaning. And Peter didn't understand it at first, but at the time of the resurrection, I believe he understood what was happening. And I believe once Jesus explained to Peter that unless he allows him to wash his feet, that he couldn't be a part of the church, I believe Peter understood. And he didn't want just him to wash his feet. He says, not only my feet, Lord, but wash me all over. And we, we read this and he said, wash me through and through. And I believe that should be a request of all of us today. Every time I come to church, I should tell Jesus, you wash me. Through and through. Cleanse me. Because I done told you guys and you agreed with me. You done walked through some dirt this week. You done heard dirt on your radio. Saw dirt on your TV. Looked at dirt on your computer. 
It goes on and on and on and on and on. The things that we put ourselves through, it should never be a service that we hold back. But we should come every service and say, God, cleanse me again. Create in me, oh God, a, cl a clean heart. Listen, there's no such thing as just a partial cleansing. You can't get partially cleansed and think everything else is all right. You got to tell God, take it all. I, I, can't, I can't just live good halfway and think I'm going to be all right. He said, I'd rather you be what? Cold or hot than lukewarm. And I'm hot right now. I don't know about y'all. but It's hot in this room today. But here we are. We, 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 we got to understand that we are in a situation that we carry dirt every day. And Peter just cried out, said, Lord, through and through, cleanse me. He said, everything, Lord, just take it all and cleanse me. I like what he said in verse 10. He said, Jesus said unto him, he that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. So I believe Peter didn't need to experience being saved again. I don't think he needed to see that and, and be cl and cleansed again. He only needed his feet washed that he would pick up all, from all the pollution that he's picked up in the last three or four weeks since the disciples had their heated discussion. He said, I just need another touch of Jesus. Oh, if I can just tell Jesus, touch me again, Lord, today. I need another cleansing today, Lord. I need something in my life. Peter only needed to have his feet washed after they had picked up that pollution of the world that he went through. Jesus said, he says, you're clean. He said, but not all. He says, you're clean. And that's when Jesus was talking about Judas. I really believe he was. You all are clean now, but there's one here. I washed your feet, but you're really not clean. And it's so many times we come to church and we get a touch of Jesus. Just a touch, but we don't surrender it all to him. We don't ask God to take that sin out of my life. You come and you feel the Holy Ghost. Woo, that's great. And you come and you cry in the altar. And you might even speak in tongues a minute. You feel good, but you're not cleansed totally. And you go back out on Monday. And the first thing you realize, you start your unfaithful spiritual life all over again. And you come back Wednesday and you try to get another touch. The touches are good. But friend, you've got to tell God, you take all of my heart. I don't, want, I don't want the world to have a part of it and my boyfriend to have a part of it and my girlfriend to have a part of it and the, I don't want the alcohol to have a part and the cigarettes to have a part and the marijuana and the drugs and the pornography. I don't want all this to take a part. And that's what we are. We're spreading ourselves thin today. We are. We're spreading so thin with things that we walk through every day in our life and we let these things comprehend who we are. But friend, I'm telling you, when you let Jesus cleanse you, you become a part of the body of Christ. Which is a powerful thing. The church is a powerful thing today. Amen. So in very, I'm going to read something to you that I, it's not part of our text. But did I, did I give it to you, Sister Sammy, uh, verse 17? If not, could you pull that up for us? Verse 17, that same chapter, uh, John 13. I don't remember if I put it on there or not. I might have didn't. But if you can pull it up. Or Brother Child is back there, I think. I can't never see through that glass who it is. Is it up there? 13 and 17, if you can, there it is. Jesus, after all, he said all of this. He comes to 17 and he says, If you know these things, blessed are ye if you do them. I believe it's ever been a time, it's time for the church, body of Christ, the people that say, I love Jesus. You can't just say you love him with your tongue and let your feet show something else. Or your hands do something else. Or your eyes do something else. But you have to put everything you got into it. He says, and then if you know these things that I'm teaching to you today. If you know these things. He said, then go do them. Put some action with it. Church, I'm telling you. I've always been told this. My mama told me this growing up. Talk is cheap. And I'm going to tell you, preaching is cheap if you're not living what you're preaching. It's cheap, my friend. I promise you, it's cheap. But you got to live it. you got to put through it. Do that. Just knowing the truth is not enough. Just knowing about Jesus' name, baptism, is not enough. Just coming to church and being faithful and doing the things that you know that you're supposed to do is, is really not enough until you really surrender everything to God and say, God, not just my feet, but I want you to cleanse everything. Amen. We must do the truth and keep doing the truth. we got to keep that. But when we do... If we keep the whole truth, nothing but the truth, we are full of joy. Because he said, these things happy are you if you do them. You'll be happy if you do them. You'll be happy when you step out by faith and live for God and do the things you're supposed to do. So I, I come back to all of that to say this today. What is foot washing? What is foot washing? 
And when you think about foot washing, we look at it as a good time to, you know, the ladies stay over here and the guys go over to the fellowship hall. And, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I, has anybody ever been in a shouting foot washing service where they splatter all the water out and, and, and they have a good time of shouting and they start speaking in tongues and, and usually the women do it more than the men. They, that seem like the women are more spiritual than the men. Men, we got we to gotta step up to the plate, guys. Amen. We got to get back to the point of really getting into this thing, realizing what it's all about. But today, my friend, as I walked through the dirt of this week, and not only did I walk through the dirt, I had dirt clods thrown at me while I was walking through the dirt. Dirt clods. Just, wow, wow, we're going to take. And God laid a foot washing message in my heart and saying, this is for you. Maybe this wasn't for you today. Maybe it's just for me. But I read, a, I read a verse to this week that really just stood out to me. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1. Sister Sammy, if, or Brother Child, if you got it. Ephesians 4 and 1. I'm going to let her, him get to it if, for a minute. Ephesians 4 and 1. I want to show you three verses here. This, this is just, just stood out to me. And it may not do anything for you. May, maybe it's just for me. But I believe God's word does not return void. He said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. God just locked me up into your life. Put me somewhere strong in your life. But he says, I, he says, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Friend, I'm telling you, when you're called by God, you need to act like you're called by God. You need to put action like you're called by God. Be faithful like you're called by God. To the end of the world, God, I want to go with you because I know you're going to go with me. But he says, he says vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, the, uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond and peace. There is one body, one Spirit, and, is of the, and as you are called, in hope of the, your calling, we all love this part, so I went on to add these two verses, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, Father of all, who's above all and through, and, and th and through all and in you all. Two words I'm going to point out to us today. We know what long-suffering is, but he says you've got to be forbearing. And endeavoring. So if I'm forbearing something, you know what that means? In, in, in our old, just our little uh, fine uh, little brain that we got, just a few words. Forbearing just means to put up with. To, to have patience toward. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, got, I had this ready yesterday. And I had a community service guy that was here yesterday. That I want to put my foot in the seat of his pants and tell him, go on and leave. That's the flesh of me. He really did. Uh, it was, uh, it, he caused my day to have a headache. And it was a misery. And, and this one guy that was with him, he said, I don't see how you put up with that right there, man. I, you know, he, he was another community service. I says, brother, I'm just trying to be patient. I'm trying to put up with it. In other words, I'm forbearing his, his slothfulness or whatever you want to call it he had. It was a messed up situation. And I had every power inside of me yesterday. I could have called 911, had him picked up because he didn't smell right. I could have called the, the power that I had and I could have threw him in his car and not signed his paper and not gave his time. I could have done all the things that I thought, yeah, I've got power to do. <laughs> but the Lord wouldn't let me. I worked myself to a frizzy yesterday trying to put up with this guy. And I thought, God, are you trying to tell me something? But forbearing. So he said, he said, uh, we got to be worthy you know, of our vocation, worthy of your call, but with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. But do I have to love somebody that's going to hurt me? Do I have to love somebody that, that smiles at me at church but talks about me around the eating table? Yes. Do I have to love somebody that, that has put me down and tried to destroy me behind my back and trying to get, you know, do we have to love those kind of people? Yes. The answer is yes. We have to understand that it's going to happen. And Jesus, he says, I want you guys to get ready, disciple, because you ain't saw nothing yet. He said, you get ready. He said, because when you're tearing that upper room that we're washing in right now, you be right here. I'm going to pull the Holy Ghost out. Great things are going to happen. But you ain't seen nothing yet because when God's spirit falls out, the enemy is going to come in like a rage. He's going to come in like a, a, a neck. He's never come in before. And he's coming in destroyed. I'm going to tell you, that's why we're having such good church around here. If you miss Wednesday night, say shame on me. Wednesday night was a powerful service. Wednesday night Bible study. Brother Michael Bishop preached a, a masterpiece of a sermon. You ought to go back and listen to it on, the, on, on YouTube if you wasn't here. I dismissed church 
Hour and a half later, these guys still over here speaking in tongues, having church just all around the altar. That's what it's all about. How much of Jesus can I get? I don't think you can get too much. You don't have to worry about getting too much of Jesus. But here we are. He said, forbearing the people that's going to come against me, the people that's going to throw the rocks. They're going to throw rocks at you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to put you down. But don't let it disturb your spirit because God says, I will help you fight the enemy. I will go before you. I am on your side. If, if greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Church, we got all the confirmation that Jesus is on our side. But he's not going to be on our side if we don't let him cleanse us. Because if you don't let him cleanse you, you try to take the battle on your own. And you try to figure all the situation out by yourself. I don't care how smart you think you are today. And there's some here that think you're so smart that you got it all figured out. I used to think that way. But you know what? I got married. No, just kidding. But <laughs> I love you. Just want to wake you up a minute. But the thing is, we're not as smart as we think we are. No matter how many grades, good A's you got on your report card, that don't mean you're smart. You just studied out of a book and you learned the answer. My friend, if you'll study out the book, the Bible, you'll learn the answer. And I believe Jesus gave the, great, the, the greatest command right here. This is washing my brother's feet that I can, in, I can have long suffering, forbearing and love and endearing to keep the unity of spirit and bond and peace. If I can just do that, that's, that's washing my brother's feet. And even though it's dirt in my life, friend, I'm going to tell you, when you got dirt in your life, you always want to try to look at everybody else. Well, he's dirtier than I am. He's got more dirt than I do. He's been through this and that. You know why? The only reason you do that is you're trying to cover up your dirty toes. Come on, don't do that. How about come to the altar and say, God, cleanse me today. Let me have a new walk with you, Lord. God, I messed up yesterday. Oh, God. God, I didn't do what I should have done, Lord. God, I spoke things I shouldn't have spoke, God. Lord, would you cleanse me today, Lord? And I don't know about you. When I get to that point in my life, it makes me want to love everybody. It makes me want to reach out and worship with everybody. It makes me want to have a better church service. And I'm getting ready. i got five, six minutes left today. But I want to show you something. In our chapter today, the same chapter, the very same chapter, of Jesus took the disciples aside. He girded himself. He began to wash their feet. And he began to cleanse the great I am. You know, today, I believe this. If Jesus Christ himself walked in here today and sit down in his chair and we knew for a fact that he was Jesus Christ, I believe there's not a one of you that would not wash Jesus' feet. Matter of fact, you'll line up or try to be the first one in line to wash the master's feet, the great I am. Because we know he's perfect and he's the great I am. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And oh, I want to wash his feet. But my friend, what about the brother that you have all against? What about the sister that has hurt you? What about the man that has thrown things? Friend, it doesn't, it doesn't give you a right to hate him or her. Matter of fact, Jesus said in the same chapter of John 13, Let's go down to verse 34 if we can, brother child. John 13, 34. At the end of this chapter, almost the last two or three verses here, I want to show you what he said in John 13 and 34. If you can find that, brother child. I know it's taking a minute, but I want to make sure we see it on the board. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. This is powerful right here. Apostolics, I'm going to be honest with you. I had a man tell me the other day, and he's apostolic now. But he said he, he was changed from another denomination to apostolic. But he said he's never seen so much backbiting and fussing, talking about one another's church and putting down until he came to the apostolic realm. He said it didn't happen in where he came from. It was like it was love. Everybody just cared about things and people had love. And this was just told to me these last two or three weeks that this guy talked to me about. Computer went down, so get your Bibles open, guys. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. The greatest, the po most powerful thing you can do in this place today is love that lady or that guy sitting beside you or sitting across the church from you because you don't want to sit on that side of the church where they're at. That's how much you don't like them. The truth hurts, don't it? But Jesus, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not a preacher that's going to sit up here and give you a big cheese smile and say, Jesus loves you the way you are. He does, but He loves you too much to leave you that way. Aren't you glad He loves you too much to leave you that way? He can change my life in a direction I need to be. 
But he said these words, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So if I can get that, God's love. There will never be a divorce if we done like Jesus said. Love your wife as I, I, you know, Christ loves the church. It will never be a divorce if people would do that. But we have a love problem. We don't have any. This is the problem. We have a love problem in our life. We do. We have a love problem. Look at your neighbor and say, I can do better. Oh, you love your husband. Tell somebody else across the way. You can do better. Hallelujah. We, the only person we have church with sometimes is our husband and our wife. We don't, we, don't, we don't know nothing else about the body of Christ. But friend, we need to move out today and tell somebody we love them. He said, I have loved you. And this is in the same chapter that he said, wash one another's feet as I have washed your feet. That you love one another, he said. By this shall all men know. Listen to this. This is powerful. This last verse 35, and I'm done, okay? He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Y'all let that sink in for a second. This you know that you are my disciple because now you have loved your neighbor. You have loved that person even though he has a dirty life. But we all can agree on one thing today. There's not nobody in here that does not have dirt in your life. Jesus says if you don't have any dirt in your life, you throw the first rock. You throw the first one. You go ahead and throw it. You can't. We don't have it. Because if you, if you say you don't have dirt, you just built a big old dirt mound in your life because you just lied. But he said, by this you all know that you are my disciples. If you have love toward one another. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to have a foot washing today. I'm ready to wash somebody's feet. Hey, but I, before I do, I got to rebuke all this pride that we have built up in our lives. Because you know what? If everybody was as good as me, we have a great church. That's what we feel sometimes, don't we? We feel that way. Come on, we do. We have that in our life that, hey, I got it all going on. It's, no, we don't, church. We got to get up back into the spirit of foot washing. We got to get back and let God cleanse us. You see, we're, we're like Peter, you know, we, we'll say, hey, Brother Hunt needs to be cleansed, but I ain't going to get up in all of that. I ain't worthy of that. I'm not worthy to go to that altar today and let God touch my life. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy because I got this sin in my life and I got this going on and, you know, I, and, and I can't raise my hands because I don't feel worthy to raise my hands. Don't let the devil lie to you like that. You are worthy to praise God. He said, let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Everybody go. Look at your neighbor and say, he said, do this. We all have breath today. And we got a right to praise the Lord. We're going to have church today. Praise the Lord. We're going to have a good time in the Holy Ghost. Sister Kim Ramsey is going to preach to us today. Not only to the kids, but we're going to have a great time today in the Holy Ghost. I was in a youth revi a children revival one time. And 21 people got the Holy Ghost. And 13 of them was over 18 years old. One of them was in his 60s. Because they realized it's not just for the little bitty kids. But it's for the whole church. The whole body. And today, I want us to have a good time in the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going to take a break for about 10 minutes, but I'm going to encourage you in this break time, while the children are coming in, I want you to go and love somebody's neck and tell them you love them. How, how, about, how about somebody across the way? Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap today while we're getting ready for change the order of the service. God bless you. Love you today.